Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. We are continuing our discussion with former Black Panther Eddie Conway, who was released six months ago from prison after serving 44 years for supposedly killing a police officer, but a crime that anyone I know that's looked at the situation, a crime he didn't commit. Thanks for joining us. Okay. We're, we're picking up our conversation about the Panthers and the, the split that took place. Uh, the, there was a section that wanted to continue uh, and, and further develop a more militant armed struggle. Uh, they called it armed self-defense. And a section that wanted to push more in terms of community organizing, even had, I think, had an electoral strategy. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about it and where, where were you in, in, in the split? Well, I sided with Oakland. I was already in prison at that point anyway. I think uh, that probably occurred uh, in 71, maybe, perhaps, is when that, that particular split happened, right? Uh, I, um, I had always considered organizing in the community uh, the survival programs, uh, as the way in which we needed to develop support and have the, not only take care of the community, but have the community also uh, take care of us in terms of uh, uh, helping us create uh, our health clinics, et cetera, right? Uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the police cer certainly had, the uh, COINTELPRO played a key role in creating that split and for formating violence uh, uh, around the issue because they basically, they worked, uh, we had uh, international, the Black Panther Party at that time, had uh, chapters in 37 states, but it also had an international section in Africa, in Algiers, Elders Cleaver was there, Catherine Cleaver was there, a number of our People were there. Uh, we were working with the PLO at the time. Uh, there was a European section uh, in Scandinavia. Uh, and I think the Panthers that were out of the country, uh, some of them were being trained by the PLO, some of them were out of the country for various reasons, uh, either wanted or, or uh, they fled uh, uh, arrests or et cetera. Uh, some of them were out of the country as a result of airplane hijacking and that kind of stuff. Uh, and I think that group that was out of the country was uh, uh, in interacting with the PLO and interacting with uh, other guerrilla groups in Africa uh, had became more uh, uh, radicalized in terms of armed struggle, the necessity for armed struggle here in America. And then the assassination of our key, some of our key members kind of uh, aggravated that whole situation. Uh, we had key members assassinated in LA. We had key members assassinated in uh, Illinois. We had key members assassinated in uh, New York. Uh, and uh, the people out of the country that were uh, advocating uh, armed warfare, uh, was looking at that as a, a need to respond to that kind of stuff. What do you think was the role of COINTELPRO, the police infiltration, in, in terms of this? Well, they did, uh, the one, they did the assassinations. I mean, they, they, they were directly uh, uh, involved in the assassination in uh, L.A. with our key leaders. They uh, end up uh, uh, being sued and end up paying two million dollars for their involvement in the assassination of uh, Fred Hampton and our Illinois and leaders. Shot in his bed while he's sleeping. Yeah, yeah, and they end up have to pay uh, uh, one point eight million dollars uh, to the survivors because it was proven that the government had actually violated the civil rights of everybody. Do, do, you, think uh, the, do you think the police were the infiltrators, Asian provocateur types, do you think they were pushing Panthers towards a more armed position to, they were, to help rationalize these kinds of attacks? They were goading, pushing is probably the you know, uh, yeah, you know, they, uh, 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 one particular case in uh, uh, Illinois, say, uh, 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 O'Neill, uh, 
uh, William O'Neill was his name. He, uh, the, 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 the federal agents uh, made phone calls to the Blackstone Rangers, which at the time was a, a, a street organization uh, uh, with about 5,000 members. Uh, the leader was named Jeff Ford. They made phone calls to him saying that the Panthers, Fred Hampton, say, which was in charge of the, the Panthers at that time, which only could have been a few hundred strong at best, uh, but had really strong community support that uh, Fred Hampton had ordered a, a hit on Jeff Ford because he wanted to take over the Blackstone Rangers. They in turn, the FBI agents that is, and this is all in the COINTELPRO papers, called Fred Hampton and said that the Blackstone Rangers was going to wipe out the Panthers because they had some concern that they was taking over their community. This agent provocateur, Williams, uh, William O'Neill was his name, actually shot off a pistol in a gathering in which there were Blackstone Rangers and Panthers and tried to trigger a shootout among both groups, right? And of course, this was, this was discovered later you know, and it was just it was just by the skin of the teeth that there was no violence and no incident, you know. Uh, but there was this kind of deliberate agitation and aggravation uh, among different groups to cause warfare, to cause people to shoot each other. And um, they played a key role in that, and they played a role in the letters that went back and forth from Algiers to Oakland to New York, a uh, poison pen letters that was threatening Huey was threatening Cleaver, Cleaver was threatening Huey, and all of this stuff was going on. None of this was happening, but the mail made it seem like it was happening. Yeah, the police were writing and, these, and, and, writing these and, letters. And yeah, they were writing the letters and they were putting and names on it, and they was yeah. they were suggesting that this was happening or that was happening, and so on, and. It, it created a sense of paranoia, and then at some point it created actually a hostility and conflict, and people end up getting shot or killed as a result of some of this stuff. Uh, in some cases, they actually had their agents uh, uh, up in Northern California, say for instance, a key finance member of the Black Panther Party in California, Fred Bennett was his name, was assassinated up in one of the guerrilla training camps up in the Santa Monica or somewhere, directly as uh, ag ag agitation from an FBI agent, Tom Metzler was his name, right? And, it, and, and he reported that he had this guy killed. And Johnny Carr, which was, uh, I, I don't want to get too complicated here, but Johnny Carr, which was uh, George Jackson's lieutenant, right, end up getting assassinated as a result of them putting records, putting files in his prison records that didn't, wasn't real, mm -hmm. that inferred that he was a snitcher and he was informing, and when, and then they dropped a note and, and people went and investigated and found these records and said, oh, he's snitching, mm -hmm. well, and he ended up getting assassinated. Partly what you thought then, but also what you think now, assessing the situation. What is the relationship, do you think, between armed self-defense, community organizing, and what happened there? I mean, what, certainly what electrified people mm -hmm. about the Panthers mm -hmm. wasn't just a breakfast program. Mm -hmm. It was the fact that they took up this banner of armed self-defense. Mm -hmm. If it had been just a bre breakfast program, it mm -hmm. probably wouldn't have had the same impact that it did. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it was such a threat mm -hmm. to the state mm -hmm that it brought on an enormous assault. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what, what was right or wrong about it? I mean, how well, do you Well, it? There's, there's, there's three things that, that's, that's fact, that gotta be factored in here. First, there were other armed self-defense groups all over America, the, the American Nazi Party, the, the Ku Klux Klan, the, uh, the uh, states' right parties, uh, uh, white supremacists, all kinds of militant, white groups all around America armed, openly current armed. But they, they don't threaten the, the status quo the way they, they, armed black people do. They don't because they weren't black. Yeah. 
So black was one of the key factors that was frightening, but also having a philosophy of socialism was also a factor that was very frightening because the example the Black Panther Party set in its socialist programs uh, was a threat to the structure of capitalism in, in America and in the world, in fact. Uh, so that was scary. The other thing was the ability of the, because there were other armed black groups, there were black self-defense groups all over the black community, but it was only the Panthers that were working with white groups and that was working with Mexicans and that was working with uh, 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 Puerto Ricans and that was working with the American Indians and that was working with the Asians. And all of those different groups imitated the Black Panther Party and their thing, the Brown Berets, they armed themselves to, to protect their community, aimed the American Indian movement, or what we call Red Berets, they did the same thing. The, uh, the Young Lords, they did the same thing. And the, the White Panthers, which people don't even probably even know exist, they did the same thing. But other white, the White Patriot Party, other groups, did the same thing. They armed themselves in and used the Black Panther Party as a template to do programs in their community. That was the threat. Mm. The threat of all of these different people from all of these different communities working together. That Panthers could become the, the core of a revolutionary yeah. movement. Yeah, and so that was a threat, you know. Uh, and uh, it is, it is, it is, those three things, pretty much, that 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 created the kind of reaction that made the government say, "Well, okay, we need to to destroy this organization." Well, when you look back, could that have been avoided? And, and what I mean by that, I mean the amount of infiltration, the amount of uh, the way they were able to get such fractional fighting, factional fighting going. Did did the arm? I know a lot of the kind of more adventurous armed actions were encouraged by the cops, mm -hmm. um, but you know, might there have been a way to prevent that? Uh, well, looking like, back, like, yeah. with, with, with a hindsight from where I, I, I sit right now, I don't think it would have been possible to stop the destruction of the Black Panther Party. Historically, if you look back, all the way back to slavery, say for instance, any time there had ever been any organized black activities just for, for human rights, just for recognition of peoplehood, there has always been a concerted effort either through the community or through the government to destroy, whether it was a maroon communities or whether it was a black community, Wall Street, say, for instance, in uh, Oklahoma, whatever community, or Rosewood, you name it, community that stood up and declared that they were humans and they needed to be treated like other human beings and they was gonna take care of themselves. Those communities were always destroyed. I think all the efforts historically in America has been that white supremacy have organized to destroy any real effort for black people to gain power and gain control over their community because there's an economic relationship that means that if black people gain power and gain control of their community, white people don't get the benefit from that. Well, so it's sold anyway. I mean, yeah. So it's sold to sections yeah, of the yeah, white working class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The and, and that's true yeah. because I'm really talking about the ruling class and yeah. I'm not talking about because it, it, it is that divide and conquer that keeps yeah. us from I mean, they've been together. selling this to white yeah. workers since yeah. the American yeah. Revolution that, yeah. that all but, whites are in the same boat. Yeah, but, but, but and I guess we have to say institutional racism and, 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 and white supremacy has allowed segments of the white population to enjoy creature comforts and material advances as a result of the oppression of people of color. Uh, 
-hmm. you know, especially uh, even especially globally. Yeah, uh, uh, whether you're talking about the universities or whether you're talking about uh, just opportunities, you know, or whether you're talking about the, the who controlled the fire department, you know, there's a, there's a relationship for oppression and there's a relationship, even though white supremacy is being controlled and used uh, by a small segment and directed by a small segment of people for their own benefit, economic benefit, it still benefits a large portion of the population in yeah. order to make it a viable ideology. Yeah. 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 Looking back, mm -hmm. uh, was it a mistake to take up armed self-defense? Uh, I'm not making, I'm not at all mm -hmm. mean a moral issue. Yeah. From mm -hmm. a tactical strategic issue. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Was it almost a little, I, I, I can't say, I don't think the correct word is naive, but was there some feeling that the, st the state, at least at maybe even at the federal level, is, had a little liberalness to us? There wouldn't be this such a vicious assault? Because mm. like, if you knew there was going to be such a vicious reaction, and I wonder if there wasn't some of that even spillover from the civil rights movement in the sense that, you know, the Kennedys helped a little bit keeping getting people out of jail. We've interviewed Bob Moses and he's mm -hmm. talked about how, mm -hmm. you know, the Kennedys actually did get them out of jail mm -hmm. when they were down and you know, mm -hmm. organizing in the South. Mm -hmm. And they certainly postured that they were for desegregation mm -hmm. and such. Mm -hmm. Was there an underestimation of just how vicious the reaction would be? And, mm -hmm. th and thus a kind of mistake. Obviously, it was a mistake. Obviously, hindsight, we can see it was a mistake. But I think it was a calculated risk that both Huey and Bobby and other people uh, took when they realized that in order to organize in the black community, you had to have the ability to protect yourself. Because up until that point, when you look at black organizers, you see bodies hanging on trees. You see bodies in the Mississippi River with uh, engine blocks on them. You see bodies being burned in houses and buildings. Organizers, black organizers, have always been subjected to violence and have been subjected to white supremacy and have been killed. And have been killed, whether you were talking about a Malcolm X or whether you were talking about a Martin Luther King, whether you were talking about somebody that was like peaceful and nonviolent and they were just riding the bus down the interstate. They were always being attacked. They were being killed. They were being killed. They were being abused. And at some point, people said, well, OK, if we're going to organize, at least let's up the stakes. If you're going to kill us, you're going to kill us fighting back. And I think that was a calculation that was correct at the time. But it was a miscalculation in a sense that we had no idea the threat exists because we were international socialists, not because we were armed. The threat exists because we were willing to work with people across all the different ethnic groups. That was the threat. The armed, the armed thing never was a threat. The amount, the number of Panthers was never a threat. You know, uh, you're, you're talking a few thousand, you know, maybe several thousand and so on. And you're talking maybe a support base of maybe a hundred or two thousand. Well, was it a thousand. mistake to have a socialist agenda? N well, no, it wasn't a mistake. We just didn't realize how dangerous that was. The, the, the reaction is the same reaction that's against, that, that's causing them right now to boycott Cuba 60 years later. Uh, it's the same reaction that caused them to not recognize China for 25 years. It's the same reaction that created the Iron Curtain. There is a, and, 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 and I don't even want to say it's white supremacy as much as this is the ruling class reacts vigorously to anything that will talk about economic democracy leveling the playing field, taking care of everybody. In other words, I can't have this gold mine, I can't have this diamond mine, I can't have this island, I can't have this yacht. We're gonna kill y'all or we're gonna choke y'all to death until y'all gone because 
this island is mine, this yacht is mine, this land is mine, etc. That reaction was toward the uh, socialism as opposed toward the gun because there was all kinds of groups in America, black, white, red, and so on, that were armed. But there was only those groups that were talking socialism that was attacked and destroyed. And nothing's more threatening than, than the African Americans get organized and around that becomes mm -hmm. a whole movement to yeah. take away those yachts and those islands yeah. and that privilege. And that was the th and and to do it in such a way in which you recognize the humanity of, of whites, poor whites, you recognize the humanity of Puerto Ricans, you recognize the humanity of the Native Americans, you recognize the humanity of the Asian Americans, etc. That was the threat that they would all they were all working together, they all came together, that it was that idea that was more threatening than carrying those weapons. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. And thank you for joining us. We'll pick up and continue our conversation with Eddie Conway on Reality Asserts Itself, and we'll talk more about the greatest threat. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>